Chapter 4.9 illustrates some of the ways in which artists have explored, reinforced, and challenged traditional expectations of identity. Personal identity includes aspects of gender, race, ethnicity, cultural heritage, as well as sexuality, and much more. By presenting their personal experiences, interpretations of historical events, or responses to social and political agendas, artists may encourage viewers to question common assumptions about identity and become aware of the possibilities of individual experience beyond simplistic labels and stereotypes. One obvious way that an artist can explore their own personal identity is through self-portraits. Now, of course, in self-portraits, the maker and the subject are the same person, whereas in a regular portrait, the artist depicts someone else. Um, self-portraits are a great way to explore um, the physical likeness or the sort of external appearance of the artist, but they can also tell us something about the artist's personality, their experiences, and their choices. Um, and it can help the artist to better understand themselves and to grapple with ideas such as um, their own mortality. Um, the complexity of a self-portrait is really linked to the fact that the artist and the subject are the same person. 17th century Italian artist Artemisia Gentileschi brought the characters of her paintings to life by using them to respond to or depict personal experiences. In this, her most famous self-portrait, she combines features of her own likeness with the depiction of the female personification of painting. She shows herself hard at work with paintbrush in mid-air and the sleeve of her dress rolled up showing her muscular arm. Her face, with her intense, concentrated gaze, is bathed in light, symbolizing intellect and inspiration, and her dark, unkempt hair symbolizes the divine frenzy of artistic creation. Relating her own likeness to the classical descriptions of the allegory or personification of painting communicates her identity as one of the very few female artists, yet one of the most successful painters of this time, and she is very passionately dedicated to her work. Gentileschi is also known for depicting powerful biblical heroines whose stories have strong connections to events in the artist's own life. For example, she painted at least seven known works that depicted different moments from the Old Testament story of the Israelite Judith's encounter with the Assyrian general Halifernes. Halifernes' army had been sent by the Assyrian king to punish the Israelites for not supporting his reign. Halifernes had already conquered Judah's city, but in an effort to save her people, she allowed him to believe that he had seduced her, and then with the help of her maidservant, she killed him with his own sword after he drank too much wine. On the left, Gentileschi depicts the climax of the story using directional lines and strongly contrasting values to draw attention to the violent decapitation of Halifernes at the hands of these determined women. On the right, Judith and her maidservant make their escape from the murder scene by candlelight, the dramatic shadows heightening the suspense of the moment. Through contextual and feminist analysis, these works have been interpreted as an expression of the artist's own experiences. Gentileschi was the victim of grooming and sexual assault by Augustino Tassi, her painting teacher and a colleague of her father. During the public rape trial that followed the assault, Tassi claimed that Gentileschi was not only a willing lover, but very promiscuous. Eventually, Tassi was found guilty and he was exiled, but in addition to the physical and emotional violence that Artemisia Gentileschi suffered during the assault, her name and her reputation were further attacked during the trial. Gentileschi's first version of Judith and her maidservant decapitating Halifernes was created about one year after the rape trial, while the second, better known version, as well as the depiction of the women's escape, date to about ten years later. Gentileschi's paintings of this violent narrative in which brave, beautiful women overpower the man who sought to seduce and conquer have often been interpreted as expressions of the artist's anger at her own attacker and as a way that she was sort of trying to heal the effects of her ordeal. 
while the numerous paintings she created of this story over a 30-year period were probably created for a variety of other reasons, including the general popularity of such themes at this time, there are also certainly elements of autobiography apparent within them. Um, Gentileschi's Judith has features that resemble her own, and the story has undeniable connections to her own experience, and in this later version of Judith and her maidservant decapitating Halifernes, Judith wears a golden bracelet that has vignettes of Artemis, the goddess of chastity and the hunt, who is also the artist's own namesake. The Dutch artist Rembrandt von Rijn, who was born in 1606 and died in about 1669, also made several portraits throughout his career, um, more than 90 of them to be exact. Um, these two are from later in his career, from 1658 and 1659 respectively. Um, in both, we can really see his mastery of oil paint as a medium. We're, we're seeing um, a rich sort of luminous painterly surface. Um, you can see um, some indication of a sort of loose gestural brush stroke. He's really utilizing um, chiaroscuro to model the face and the figure here and create a sense of volume or three dimensionality. Um, and then he's also incorporated some tenebrism, some of that extreme kind of um, extremely dark shadows in the background and then how that contrasts with the sort of spotlight that sits on the figure and makes the figure appear as if they are sort of dramatically emerging out of the shadows. Um, notice too that um, within the cheeks of the figures, especially the one um, in the portrait on the right of the screen here, um, on his cheeks and sort of in his nose, we see this very soft tint of red, um, sort of a blush to his cheeks and his face there, indicating, you know, blood flowing under the skin and sort of bringing this figure to life. And I think in both portraits here, there's such a an attention given to the eyes, there's really a sense of, um, you know, quiet, contemplative intensity at the same time, though. Um, there's sort of a, an intelligence, but also a tiredness within his eyes and his expression. Um, so he's really, you know, he's showing himself in this sort of relaxed, um, yet regal pose and really demonstrating a high level of sensitivity toward the human condition. Now, it's interesting to know that in 1656, so not very long before these two self-portraits were created, um, Rembrandt actually declared bankruptcy. He sold his art collection and his house. And so if you notice here with those gestural brush strokes, especially on the portrait on the left side here around the hands of the figure. It seems to imply maybe a sense of tension. And then again, that um, tiredness or weariness in the eyes. Maybe this is meant to reflect the stress that he was under during this time of um, financial, I don't know, turmoil. Um, there's also a sense of extreme realism because he's showing us um, his aging, sagging face. We can sort of see the wrinkles and the lines in his skin, um, especially under the eyes and around the mouth. Um, we can see sort of the furrowing of the brow between his two eyebrows here. He seems, again, tired and perhaps worried, and yet he's someone who has suffered and still survived with at least a majority of his dignity. Rembrandt was often very inventive with his self-portraits, and he showed himself in many different guises, um, playing characters from peasants to aristocrats, and demonstrating this interest in exploring different facial expressions and character types. In this particular self-portrait with Saskia in the scene of the prodigal son in the tavern, Rembrandt appears as the prodigal son from the biblical story of the young man who rebels against his father's wishes by squandering his inheritance. Rembrandt creates a lively mood in the tavern. His character raises his glass toward the viewer while the barmaid modeled on his wife Saskia looks on. 
For many, 19th century painter Vincent van Gogh is instantly recognizable by his red hair and beard, gaunt face, and intense gaze. Although his career only lasted about 10 years, he created some 36 self-portraits, often emphasizing the internal reality of what he felt rather than simply recording what he saw. In a letter to his brother Theo from 1889, Van Gogh wrote, quote, They say, and I am willing to believe it, that it is difficult to know yourself, but it isn't easy to paint yourself either. The self-portrait on the left side of this slide was done at the Asylum of St. Remy, where Van Gogh admitted himself following a mental breakdown, and it's among the last self-portraits that he made before his death. Here, as in several of his other self-portraits, he's holding a palette and brushes, the tools that mark his identity as a painter, and he's also wearing a painter's smock. The National Gallery of Art explains that the fervor and fragility of Van Gogh's life are told on this canvas by stark contrasts of color and restless brushstrokes. Heavy lines of paint seem to emanate from his head like a wavering force field, energized by his own intensity. This background sets off the complementary colors of his green-tinged face and orange hair, keying his image to a higher pitch. Van Gogh seemingly believed this canvas captured his true character and described the portrait to his brother Theo in a letter writing, quote, I was thin and pale as a ghost. It is dark violet blue and the head whitish with yellow hair, so it has a color effect. On the right, Van Gogh's self-portrait with bandaged ear and pipe refers to a famous incident in his life shortly before he admitted himself to Saint Remy. At the time, Van Gogh was living in Arles in the south of France, hoping to realize a dream of starting an artist colony there. His friend and fellow artist Paul Gauguin had been staying and painting with him for several weeks, but when Van Gogh learned that Gauguin planned to return to Paris, they had an intense argument during which Van Gogh threatened Gauguin with a knife and afterward cut off a portion of his own ear. He wrapped the severed earlobe in newspaper and gifted it to a prostitute in a brothel before his brother and friends found him and took him to a hospital for treatment. His self-portrait with bandaged ear and pipe in its restrained but nervous lines and bold contrasting colors displays some of the agitation that the artist experienced during this episode. And both portraits here serve as a prime example of how, for many artists, Van Gogh included, self-portraits are critical explorations of personal realization as well as aesthetic or stylistic achievement. Mexican artist Frida Kahlo was born in 1907 and died in 1954. Her artworks tend to be powerful autobiographical explorations of identity. Her self-portraits, which comprise a one-third of her total artistic output, combine a relatively naturalistic depiction of her outward appearance and often graphic depictions of her chronic physical and psychological suffering with metaphorical references to her feelings, personal experiences, relationships, her mixed cultural heritage, and more. Throughout her life, Frida Kahlo suffered severe chronic illness and pain. Um, many researchers now believe that she was born with a spina bifida, which is a medical condition that affects the development of the spinal column. Um, at the age of six, she suffered polio, which permanently damaged her right leg and caused lifelong pain and weakness. Um, then, at the age of 18, she was involved in a bus accident in which her right leg and foot were crushed, her ribs, collarbone, and spine were broken, and her abdomen and uterus were pierced with an iron handrail. Um, after as many as 35 surgeries in a three-month recovery period, she experienced severe lifelong pain and underwent several additional operations. Um, she periodically had to wear plaster corsets to help heal her spine, and she was often confined to her bed. Um, these persistent medical issues and the accident also impacted her fertility and resulted in multiple miscarriages. Now, during the initial recovery after the accident, her father brought her art supplies and she began painting. She had a special easel installed that allowed her to paint in bed and a mirror hung above it that allowed her to see herself. 
Painting proved to be an effective outlet for representing her experiences with these physical, mental, and emotional traumas. Um, she also explored her own ideas of feminism, womanhood, and cultural heritage, and developed her own personal philosophy and sense of identity. Uh, she said, quote, I paint myself because I am so often alone and because I am the subject I know best. This work, titled The Two Fridas from 1939, is a large-scale double self-portrait. Two versions of the artist, identical except for their outfits, are seated on a bench in front of a stormy sky. They hold hands and gaze out stoically at the viewer. Now, the use of a double self-portrait here is interesting, and it could have several metaphorical interpretations. The most overt connection, perhaps, is to the mirror that she had installed over her bed that allowed her to paint herself during her recovery and bouts of illness. But the double portrait also calls attention to her complex cultural identity as a woman of mixed Mexican and German Jewish heritage. Now, additionally, in 1929, at the age of 22, Frida Kahlo married the acclaimed Mexican muralist Diego Rivera, who was 42 at the time. Now, prior to their marriage, she typically wore the modern European dresses and styles of the era. But upon Rivera's encouragement to embrace her Mexican heritage, she adopted more traditional Mexican attire. So the use of two figures here allows the artist to address these two distinct aspects of her identity. The Frida on the left wears a contemporary European gown reflecting her father's German roots and the styles that she wore in her earlier life. The Frida on the right wears a traditional Mexican skirt and blouse reflecting her mother's heritage and the styles that she embraced after her marriage to Rivera. As in many of her works, human anatomy is graphically depicted here with the two vulnerable exposed hearts, one of which is further ripped open. This presentation emphasizes the sensitive emotional content of the painting. Uh, Frida Kahlo often used blood as a visceral metaphor of union. And so the two figures here, they're not only holding hands, but they are also further connected by a common artery that stretches between their two hearts. Um, perhaps this represents the literal mixture of Mexican and European bloodlines within her veins, or maybe it symbolizes a newfound unity between the two halves of her cultural identity. It's also significant to note here that the year she painted this canvas is the same year that Calo divorced Rivera, and the exposed hearts and arteries are indicative of her feelings of sadness and vulnerability at the time. On the right, the artery wrapping around traditional Frida's arm feeds into a miniature portrait of Rivera, which indicates that part of her still pines for her lost love. On the left, modern Frida clamps down on the vein with a hemostat, figuratively severing her connection to him and literally stopping the bleeding. She has been hurt and that cannot be undone as evidenced by the bright red blood that stains her white dress, marring its symbolic innocence, but she is strong and she is resilient and she will get through this. Kahlo's 1944 self-portrait titled The Broken Column is perhaps one of her most powerful and emotionally charged works. It serves as a clear metaphor of the physical and emotional pain that she experienced throughout her life and as a testament to her strength and resiliency. Kahlo's figure fills the majority of the composition, and while her facial expression is once again stoic, her eyes, which are emphasized by her darkened monobrow, express her suffering and tears spill onto her cheeks. Her lower body is covered with a flowing white sheet while her torso is naked. Nails pierce her skin and her body is cracked open, revealing that her spinal column has been replaced with a Greek ionic column, which has often been considered the feminine architectural order.
The column is ancient and ideal, but crumbling and no longer effective in supporting her body, symbolizing the physical and emotional pain she suffered, specifically her continuous back pain and the repeated spinal surgeries that she underwent to try and alleviate some of that pain. Her body, like the column, is broken, held together with bandages and braces and sheer willpower, resulting in a rigid, upright posture that, in combination with her controlled facial expression, conveys this idea that Kolo is a strong, resolute woman, while still acknowledging her pain, her vulnerability, and her fragility. Kolo's artworks were also deeply political and feminist, and this one is no exception. The painting can be seen as a commentary on the way women's bodies and emotions have often um, been considered secondary to the nation's needs during the era. Um, her nudity and the vulnerability that it represents show the sacrifice and strength of women. Um, and at the time that this work was created, Mexico was also experiencing a growing sense of nationalism and anti-colonial sentiments. And so many have interpreted the broken column as not only a metaphor for the physical and emotional pain that the artist suffered, but also as a symbol of the crumbling of Mexico's past and a desire to rebuild a stronger and more unified nation. Personal identity affects everyone on some level, but it really became a central issue for artists in the late 20th century. At this time, many long marginalized or oppressed groups began celebrating difference. Um, they began to take pride in being part of non-white ethnic minorities, to take pride in being female, being gay, trans, being black or Hispanic. Um, and so we start to see artists really exploring various aspects of their personal identity in new, more direct ways. In her 1963 book titled The Feminine Mystique, author Betty Friedan explains that fulfillment as a woman had only one definition for American women after 1949, and that was the housewife mother. Um, but in the 1960s and 70s, the women's liberation movement called for greater recognition of women, both past and present. Feminist artists started to use a variety of art forms, including conceptual and performance works, to escape the male-dominated traditional art forms of painting and sculpture, and they also used imagery of female anatomy, menstruation, and reproduction to represent women's experiences and to critique the social, political, and historical oppression of women. In the late 60s and early 70s, um, feminist artists Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro founded the first feminist art program at Cal Arts. Chicago and Shapiro and 21 female art students went on to create Woman House, a collaborative art environment in an empty Victorian mansion. They renovated the mansion and filled it with feminist installations and performances, and they tried to um, sort of challenge the meaning of the room or the activity that takes place within the room and how that relates to a woman's self-image and sort of examine the relationship between biology and social or gender roles. So viewers would wind their way through this home, confronted and challenged by parodies of social expectations. In Shoe Closet by Beth Bockenheimer, for instance, viewers encountered a closet packed with painted high heel shoes, um, suggesting the transformation of woman from subject to object as a housewife who must continually change her costume and mask for her husband's pleasure. In Nutrient Kitchen, or excuse me, Nurturant Kitchen by Suzanne Frazier, Vicki Hodgetts, and Robin Welsh, the colored lighting created a pink aura that bathed the kitchen space. Resembling a factory assembly line, plates of food were lined up under the light bulbs to suggest the dehumanizing of women's role as nurturer. The ceiling and walls were covered with sculptured fried eggs that gradually transform into breasts as they come down the walls. And then aprons were covered with female body parts that could be physically removed when done with housework. 
indicating that a woman's body is inextricably connected to her societal role. Visitors encountered Faith Wilding's womb room, which consisted of crochet webs that draped the room from floor to ceiling. Meanwhile, Sandra Ogle, excuse me, Sandra Orgel built a female mannequin into a linen closet, her body oppressively interrupted at the neck, chest, and torso by shelves, and in Judy Chicago's installation menstruation bathroom, a trash bin overflowed with bloody pads, drenched Kotex liners hung from a clothesline, and used tampons were strewn about, among other shock-inducing menstrual accoutrements. The mansion would eventually be demolished, but for a short window of time, these women converted its 17 rooms into a showcase for their installations, sculptures, textiles, and performances. But it was also a place where they could engage in probing group sessions about femininity, domesticity, patriarchy, oppression, and more through artworks that juxtaposed ideas of beauty, comfort, and safety associated with the home with the terrors of domestic confinement, oppression, and and abuse. Woman House was revolutionary in that it was the first widely experienced survey of feminist art during a time when women were largely disregarded by museums and mainstream art institutions. Judy Chicago, as well as many other feminist artists in the 1960s and 70s, often incorporated what she referred to as core female imagery. Essentially, this imagery was abstracted from um, the form of female genitalia. This is sort of essentialist in that it focuses on the biological aspects of womanhood and the differences women have physically from men. But Chicago used this core female imagery as a way to challenge the male dominated art world and society and to sort of assert the value of female experience. Um, Sexual difference had so long been used to exclude women and label them as inferior to men, and Judy Chicago instead wanted to celebrate what made women different. She envisioned these core forms of female imagery as, yes, abstractions of the vulva, but also as butterfly forms, um, symbols of liberation. She says, I want to make butterfly images that are hard, strong, soft, passive, opaque, transparent, all different states. And I want them to all have vaginas and all at the same time be shells, flowers, flesh, and forest. After Woman House, realizing how many women had been forgotten or omitted from history, Judy Chicago embarked on another huge installation project. Um, this was called The Dinner Party. This is a mixed media installation that was dedicated to rescuing hundreds of women and female artists from the anonymity of history. It consists of three large tables, each 48 feet long, arranged into an equilateral triangle. Now the equilateral triangle is an ancient symbol of equality and fairness, but it's also an ancient symbol for um, femininity and for female goddesses. Um, each table features 13 place settings for a total of 39. Um, and each place setting represents a different woman, real or mythological, from various eras throughout history. Now, each side of the table has 13 place settings, which is the number of men who were in attendance at the Last Supper and the number of witches in a coven. Along the floor, an additional 999 women's names are inscribed in gold on the white tiles. Each place setting of the dinner party consists of an embroidered placemat that features the name of a famous historical or mythological woman and a ceramic plate designed using core female imagery um, to reflect that woman's identity in her time period. Now, this was a collaborative project. Judy Chicago worked with um, numerous women artists and volunteers. I believe there are about 400 total volunteers, um, most of them women, but a handful of men as well. And it took 
five years from 1974 to 1979 to complete this work. Um, they used traditionally feminine arts, including China painting on ceramic plates and um, fiber arts like embroidery and sewing. Um, this project was meant to elevate women and their experiences and their histories, the materials and art making practices that they have used historically and sort of um, educate the public about these women and kind of bring their appreciation to a new level. Um, so here we have two examples from the dinner party. We have the Emily Dickinson and Georgia O'Keeffe place setting. And then here we have a place setting for the mythical fertile goddess, a prehistoric mother goddess. Um, this place setting is interesting, particularly the embroidery that was done here. So for each setting, um, the placemats, the artists wanted to use materials and techniques that would have been used by the woman of the corresponding area. Um, so how would a prehistoric woman gone about uh, creating a textile or a placemat? Um, well, they did research and um, determined that a woman would have made her own needles out of animal bones and then used those um, to sew her textile with. And most textiles during the prehistoric era would have been made out of um, relatively rough spun wool threads. Um, and so a certain group of volunteers set about trying to recreate this process. They first um, attempted to use the carcass of a deer that they had acquired, but when they went to um, retrieve the hide and the bones, they found that the, the carcass was infested with maggots, and so they tossed that idea and started over. Um, ultimately, they ended up um, getting some cow's bones from a local butcher, I believe, and they boiled those down and whittled them into bone needles. And then they spun, um, using traditional sort of techniques, their own wool thread and used that to create this textile, this placemat. And then you can also see they've incorporated the bone needles into the decoration, and they've incorporated other small um, sort of um, ornamentations, including a small ceramic figurine that sort of mimics uh, the woman of Willendorf and other prehistoric female figurines that we were looking at a few days ago. So although women contributed significantly to artistic developments in the 1960s and 70s, major museums and galleries continued to grant special status to work by male artists. In 1984, the Museum of Modern Art in New York sponsored a huge exhibition called An International Survey of Contemporary Painting and Sculpture, which claimed to highlight the period's most important artworks. The exhibition included about 169 mostly white artists, only 13 of which were women. Shortly after, in response, a group of feminist artists, curators, critics, historians, etc. in New York formed an activist group called the Guerrilla Girls that would, as they said, quote, function as the conscience of the art world. The group sought to expose gender and racial inequalities in the art world, stand against discrimination, and fight for rights of female artists and artists of color. They adapted tactics of guerrilla warfare, acting covertly to strike at the enemy. Their first campaign was to paste posters on walls throughout New York art districts, citing damning statistics of discrimination within the city's museums and galleries. Group members were anonymous, taking on the names of dead female artists as pseudonyms, um, and they wanted to do this to sort of counter the tendency of the art world to focus on the individual rather than collective accomplishment. To protect their identities during public events and protests, they wore guerrilla masks, um, a play on the word guerrilla that reflects the group's use of humor to disarm critics and promote their message. So they wear guerrilla masks, but the name guerrilla is spelled like guerrilla warfare rather than the animal. Um, 
they produced sharp, witty posters that really drew on advertising strategies. So this is one of their most famous posters, and it appropriates uh, the reclining female nude figure from Aang's Grand Odalisque that we looked at when we were talking about romanticism. Um, but they've given her a gorilla mask of her own. And then the headline, Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into the Met Museum? So the poster here presents the findings of a survey of the Met's collection, which revealed that less than 5% of the artists in the museum were women, but 85% of the museum's nudes on display were female. Uh, the group repeated this survey in 2005, and they found that the number of women artists had only increased by 3%, um, which they humorously underscored by noting, well, at least there were more naked men. Um, here's another widely known Gorilla Girls poster that delivers a sarcastic but sadly accurate list of the treatment afforded to women artists. The advantages of being a woman artist include things like working without the pressures of success, being reassured that whatever kind of art you make, it will be labeled feminine, not having to undergo the embarrassment of being called a genius, and getting your picture in art magazines wearing a gorilla suit. In the late 20th century, other artists started um, addressing racial and ethnic differences. Now, around this time, it would have been 100 years post the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation. African Americans were still experiencing significant discrimination, segregation, disenfranchisement, oppression, and violence throughout the United States. Uh, Faith Ringgold was an African-American artist born in 1930. She was an abstract expressionist painter in the 50s, um, and then she became very inspired by both the feminist movements and the civil rights movement. Um, so this work from 1967 is titled The Flag is Bleeding, and it's part of a series of about 20 paintings that sort of focus on racial tensions of the time. We see a black man, a white man, and a white woman depicted in front of, but also covered by, the American flag. And they are linking arms with one another. Um, the flag, again, is sort of superimposed over those figures, and then the red stripes uh, sort of bleed and drip downwards over the figures as well. The black man holds a knife in one hand, um, the hand that is looped through the arm of the white woman beside him. And then his other hand covers his heart as if he is um, pledging his allegiance to the flag, but simultaneously that hand is covering a bleeding stab wound in his chest. Um, he, the black man, is fighting for his freedom, his humanity, his life, but the white woman and white man are unscathed living the American dream, sort of oblivious to the um, violence and the tragedy that he is experiencing. Faith Ringgold said of this time, we thought of the American flag as our symbol of freedom, but we were losing our freedoms in the 60s. All of the blood lying all over the sidewalk and nothing about it in the papers. I mean, silence, like it hadn't even happened. Um, and so many of her works, you know, reference this time period and they explore Jim Crow and civil rights, the assassination of MLK, um, various race riots, the idea of black pride or black power and the politics of skin color, but also ideas about women's rights, um, reformation of the prison system and her own personal experiences as a black woman in the 1960s in America. Soon after the 1964 race riots in Chicago, the American artist Wadsworth Jarrell became part of several seminal black arts movement groups, including OBAC, the Organization of Black American Culture, and AfriCobra, the African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists, which he co-founded. Their use of art to promote black pride and black empowerment messages gained international acclaim. Jarrell's dynamic 1972 screen print titled Revolutionary features high-key Kool-Aid colors named for the flavored drink mix Kool-Aid, known for its distinctive hues. 
Such words as resist, love, black, nation, revolution, and beautiful radiate from the head and body of political activist Angela Davis to signal the intensity and necessity of the message like a call to action. American artist Kerry James Marshall grew up amidst the civil rights and black power movements, which he says helped instill a sense of social responsibility into his practice. His quote, unequivocally, emphatically black figures have influenced a whole generation of younger artists and viewers. Past times, the work seen here, builds on the Western European tradition of painting, while at the same time carries forward a view centered on African American experience through locations and scenarios that resonated for the artist as a Black American. Marshall pursued painting as his medium because it was a dominant force in art museums. His visual references range from Renaissance and Baroque banners to scenes of leisure characteristic of French Impressionism. According to the artist, he used collage as a logic to bring various traditions together into a new expression. The paint splatters and unfinished areas of the painting allow us to see the artist's process while referencing both abstract expressionist brushstrokes and graffiti. At once special and mundane, this idyllic depiction begins to offset the omission of black experience from the mainstream canon of art history. On a grassy hill overlooking a lake with a city skyline in the distance, we see three figures on a red and white checkered picnic cloth looking out towards us. The young girl to our left holds a croquet mallet while the older person seated in the center opens up a picnic basket. A young boy to the right listens to music and beside him a dog curls up to rest. On the left hand side of the composition behind this group a man swings a golf club and in the lake off to the right we see another man who is boating and a woman who is water skiing. The color white is used as a unifying element within this composition. We see it in the figure's clothing, the banners, and the empty squares floating throughout the composition as if posters have been adhered to the painting surface. Sound is evoked by the scrolls flowing from two boom boxes on the picnic cloth, and the printed lyrics of songs by black musicians, including The Temptations, Just My Imagination, and Snoop Dogg's Gin and Juice, hint at imagination, lived moments, and expectant futures that might be possible for the black figures who are pictured. Adrienne Piper is another African-American artist who uses her works to embrace her ethnicity and her cultural heritage and to challenge the ways in which black people have been treated within American society. So she's African-American, but she's quite light-skinned, and so most people assume that she is white, and throughout her life she has often encountered very racist comments um, because white people have assumed they are making a comment to another white person. Not that that makes it okay, but they um, don't realize that they're speaking to someone that they are, you know, directly offending. Um, and so she began this, this series of performances. My calling card, this one is number one for dinners and cocktail parties. Um, and she performs these by handing the card out to a person after they've made a racist comment. And so she's sort of directly confronting not only racism, but ideas of racial passing um, and making the racist commenter feel a similar level of discomfort that she feels because of their comment. Um, so here we have a card that says, Dear friend, I am black. I am sure you did not realize this when you made slash laughed at slash agreed with that racist remark. In the past, I have attempted to alert white people to my racial identity in advance. Unfortunately, this invariably causes them to react to me as pushy, manipulative, or socially inappropriate. Therefore, my policy is to assume that white people do not make these remarks even when they believe there are no black people present and to distribute this card when they do. I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you just as I am sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. 
many artists built on the models of asserting identity that were set by the feminist and civil rights movements, and many were fueled by the emotion and urgency brought on by the AIDS crisis um, in the late 1980s and 1990s. Um, many artists during this time started to explore the topic of gender more broadly and consider its relationship not only to the AIDS crisis, but also to sexual identity and orientation um, in general. The American photographer Robert Maplethorpe, for example, used his own life as a gay man as inspiration for his photographs. The issue of gender affects his imagery because he chose subjects that were highly sexualized and often related to his own identity. His photographs are carefully composed, elegantly lit, and technically perfect, making subjects that might previously have been interpreted as deviant appear more normal and even beautiful. A national controversy was sparked by the exhibition of Maplethorpe's work that traveled to several museums across the United States shortly after the artist died of an AIDS-related illness in the late 1980s. Some museum officials and politicians considered the graphic sexual nature of some of Maplethorpe's photographs to be problematic because the artist had been awarded a grant from public funds. Maplethorpe, however, did not see a significant difference between a flower, a classical sculpture, or a male nude figure. Maplethorpe's subversion of binary gender distinctions can be seen in this 1980 self-portrait. The feminine appearance of the eyeshadow, the blush, and the lipstick on his face contrasts with the masculine anatomy of his bare chest. Maplethorpe's appearance here raises many questions about the assumptions we make based on the way that people look, and it reveals the degree to which gender is a construction and suggests that the conventional distinctions between the sexes are much more fluid than many people realize. Um, Maplethorpe photographed what he wanted to see, the things that he considered visually interesting but did not find elsewhere in the art world, and interpreting Maplethorpe's photograph from the perspective of gender studies really encourages us as viewers to take his intentions into account and to think about how gender affects our experience and our perspective. Uh, so in 1981, the first reports of a mysterious disease that was disproportionately affecting gay men began to emerge. Named AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome in 1983, the disease is caused by HIV, a blood-borne sexually transmitted virus that can live for years in the carrier's body and be unknowingly passed regardless of gender or sexual orientation. By the mid-1980s, AIDS had been declared a global pandemic, and by 1994, it was the leading cause of death among all Americans between the ages of 25 and 44. Throughout the 1980s, misinformation and paranoia amongst the general public, in addition to the disproportionate impact of AIDS on the gay community and pre-existing stigmas, led to a general disregard of its seriousness. The rapid spread and devastating physical effects of the disease resulted in the loss of thousands of lives, many in their prime. Many artists adapted activist strategies to educate the public and call for action, while others were inspired by personal suffering and loss to create works that confront human emotions like grief, anger, love, and hope. The political group ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, formed in New York in 1987 to combat inaction and misinformation. Artists and art collectives, including the collective Grand Fury, produced numerous artists' vehicles for ACT UP, illustrating the group's slogan, Silence Equals Death. The pink triangle that accompanies the slogan in this neon version by Grand Fury was based on pink triangles used by Nazi concentration camps to identify gay men in a bold reclamation of the symbol as one for gay rights rather than shame or, you know, othering. The neon version that you see here was first installed in the window of the new museum in New York when ACT UP was first founded, but it has also appeared in several different contexts since. The underlying message is that a group needs to articulate a visible identity and a message in order to overcome exclusion. 
Other artists were more inspired by personal suffering and loss, and they created works that confront human emotions like anger, grief, love, and hope more directly. Felix Gonzalez Torres demonstrates a minimalist interest in sparsity, geometry, repetition, and mass production, combined with deeply personal meaning in works that offer profound statements on human mortality and loss. In 1990, the artist's longtime partner, Ross Laycock, was dying of AIDS. Gonzalez Torres's untitled Lover Boy on the left here consists of a stack of blue, um, excuse me, pale blue papers that were, you know, stacked on the gallery floor with instructions for visitors to take a sheet with them as they pass through. As they do this, the stack diminishes in height um, and serves as an allegory for the slow disappearance of Ross's body as the disease progresses. Similarly, um, the work on the right, untitled Portrait of Ross in L.A. from 1991, consisted of a 175-pound pile of individually wrapped candies, again with instructions for viewers to take a piece of candy from the pile as they move through the space. The starting weight of 175 pounds equals Ross's ideal healthy weight, and again, the act of removing candies diminishes the pile, mimicking how Ross's body was slowly deteriorating due to his disease. Involving the viewers realizes the meaning of the work, and it sends them away with a small reminder of its purpose, and it transforms a story of personal or individual loss into a more universal political act that really, uh, sorry, that really called attention to the social impact of the AIDS crisis, and it sort of serves as a memorial, again, for those who were lost. Since the late 1970s and 1980s, art has become increasingly concerned with social issues and addressing the concerns of a culturally diverse world. Art institutions have begun to recognize the need to be more inclusive in their consideration of artists from all backgrounds, and many artists are driven by a desire to have their voices heard so that their artworks reveal the specificity or individuality of their cultural backgrounds and identities. Many artists are engaging directly with difficult narratives or revisiting histories to introduce elements that have previously been overlooked or perspectives that were not previously supported. For example, Fred Wilson, an American artist with African, Native American, and European ancestry, draws on his background as an art educator to rearrange objects in museum collections. He takes on the role of a museum curator, or the person responsible for overseeing, preserving, and exhibiting objects, and then converts that role into an art action. The artist's previous employment at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the American Museum of Natural History, and the American Crafts Museum gave him insight into the ways in which museum displays create certain experiences that have specific effects on audiences. And in his own artworks, Wilson looks critically at the assumptions behind the ways in which museums exhibit these artworks. In Mining the Museum, Wilson selected and presented objects only from the collection of the Maryland Historical Society. He included objects rarely seen because they were usually in storage and arranged them in unusual ways. He also provided provocative wall labels and installed audio loops to accompany certain pieces. One section of the installation displays five cigar store Indians with their backs to the viewer. Since the 19th century, these wooden, usually, sculptures um, of Native American chiefs and tribe members have commonly been used as sidewalk displays for tobacco shops in America, thus the kind of label as Cigar Store Indians. Um, the title, Portraits of Cigar Store Owners, here is ironic because Native Americans would never have owned cigar stores at the time. It is also critical of the degradation of the dignity of Native Americans that is involved in turning them into advertising signs. Throughout mining the museum, the museum's unconscious racial biases are exposed. 
As a result of this installation, the Maryland Historical Society realized it had never staged an exhibition about enslavement or institutionalized racism, despite the fact that eight out of the ten Baltimore residents are African American. So we've already sort of seen how art can be used as a very powerful vehicle for telling stories about both personal and cultural identity. Um, so here we have another great example. This artist is James Luna. Um, he is of mixed Mexican American and Native American heritage. And he uses performance art as a way to bring cultural conceptions to light in simultaneously humorous and serious ways. Um, this particular work is titled The Artifact Piece. He first performed this in 1987 at the Museum of Man in San Diego, which is an ethnographic museum rather than an art museum. Um, and so in this work, as well as many of his others, he asks viewers to confront the stereotypes that they have about Native Americans. So here he lays almost completely naked within a display case inside the museum. Um, it's filled with sand and other artifacts from his life, such as favorite, um, some of his favorite books, his favorite music or personal papers. And then museum style labels um, point out various marks or scars on his body. And so he's turning himself into this living ethnographic object for people to sort of ogle or judge. He's objectifying himself to challenge the prejudices and highlight the role that um, museums and other institutions play in the perpetuation of these stereotypes. He is actively embracing his cultural heritage and challenging the ways that people view that heritage. In his performance, Take a Picture with a Real Indian, um, first conceived in the 1990s, um, James Luna dons a, quote, traditional native outfit and stands stoically posing for snapshots with tourists to call attention to, again, the stereotypical perceptions that people have about Native Americans. Um, so in the photos from 1991, you can see these various representations of Luna and how, um, you know, he has donned this traditional or expected outfit of a Native American chief um, and juxtapose that next to himself wearing sort of modern or contemporary clothing. Um, the image on the right was taken on Columbus Day, October 11th, 2010 at Union Station in Washington, D.C. Um, and so this was a performance of this particular work in which he, you know, stood out in front of the Columbus Monument and took pictures with tourists. Um, he said that the performance lasted until he felt, quote, mad enough or humiliated enough. Um, he said that this is sort of a form of dual humiliation. Um, the interactions that he has between, or excuse me, with the tourists may seem sort of lively and fun, but they are meant to contrast the viewer's simplistic preconceptions with his embodied reality as a living person. And he hopes that this will leave people with an understanding that cultural identity is not a joke and neither are the stereotypes. Jane Quick to See Smith is another Native American artist who takes on a lot of issues within her works. Um, she tackles things like tribal and community affiliations and racial stereotypes, um, but she also pulls from her own Native identity and addresses myths of her ancestors in contexts of current issues. Um, she's interested in educating the public about and preserving Native American culture, and she's also interested in environmental activism, consumerism, mass media, as well as other things. 
Um, <clears throat> so this particular work is titled Trade, Gifts for Trading Land with White People from 1992. Um, and so this work was a reaction to the celebration of the 500th anniversary of Columbus's landing and the beginning of the mistreatment of Native Americans. She's also referencing this allegorical story about how Dutch colonists acquired the island of Manhattan from Native Americans in exchange for about 60 guilders worth of goods, which today would be about $24 worth of stuff. Um, now, this is probably somewhat exaggerated, but the existence of this story implies that Native Americans were pretty frequently tricked out of their lands by cheap goods. Um, so the surface of this composition has been collaged with generalized depictions of nation people. Um, there are newspaper articles about native life, photos, comics, tobacco wrappers and chewing gum wrappers, advertisements, images of deer and buffalo and native men in traditional dress. And then she has incorporated a sort of expressionist application of paint and this uh, sort of superimposed ghostly outline of a Native American canoe. Across the top of the composition, we have all of these hanging objects. This is a collection of stereotypical commercial images um, that sort of appropriate images of Native Americans and Native culture um, to sell goods. Um, we've got things like hats with images of sports mascots and again wrappers from food or gum and tobacco. We have Native American dolls and other objects. And so by incorporating these things the artist is sort of reversing that historic sale of land for goods and really trying to emphasize how native culture has been commodified. Uh, Shirin Neshat is an Iranian-born artist who moved to the United States in 1974 for her studies. In 1979, the Islamic Revolution broke out in Iran and she was unable to return to her home country until 1993. And when she did, she found that the country had been transformed by a fundamentalist regime. One of the most immediate physical changes this brought about was the requirement of Arab women to wear head-to-toe black coverings called shadors. In Iran, the shador has long been political territory. It was viewed as an emblem of backwardness at the start of the 20th century, and it was abolished in 1936. In the 60s and 70s, the shador became a feminist declaration of emancipation from the stereotypes of beauty and tyranny of international cosmetics industry. Um, that was, of course, before it was made mandatory. Post-Islamic Revolution, the Shador has been interpreted as a kind of prison uniform, denying sexuality and individuality. In the Western world, the Shador has long been viewed as um, what some call, quote, a repellent artifact of political repression. And then one scholar and art historian, Leila Ahmed, calls it, quote, the most visible marker of um, the differentness and inferiority of Islamic societies. So in response to the sort of changes of the Islamic revolution, specifically the requirement of women to wear the shador, Shirin Neshat began creating poetic photos and films that kind of explore the complicated realities of gender, religion, and cultural difference. In her 1994 to 97 series titled Women of Allah, Neshat exposes Western stereotypes of Muslim women, claiming their identities are more varied and complex than what is usually assumed. Um, so in this photograph, Rebellious Silence, the artist has dressed herself in a traditional shador, leaving only her face partially exposed. She's then written in traditional Farsi calligraphy, militant feminist poetry. Um, a rifle barrel vertically bisects the composition and the woman's figure. The veil, the calligraphy, and the gun all sort of separate us from the woman, um, and they kind of protect her, but they also show just how little we understand about her. 
She looks out at the viewer, kind of meeting our gaze directly, challenging beliefs about submissive Muslim women, and simultaneously underscoring fears of the fundamentalist Islamic militarism or the, the fundamentalist regime. Um, here are a few other images from Nishat's Women of Allah series, again using Iranian feminist poetry and traditional Farsi calligraphy. Um, now these images were produced for Western audiences and they really confront national prejudices and raise questions about the role of women in a post-revolutionary Iran. Neshat's artworks serve as a way for her to process her feelings of displacement, exile, and loss. Over time, her works have taken a more critical stance against the erosion of individual freedom in the extremist environment she knows the people of her country are enduring. In such artworks as the film Rapture, Neshat projects two images into a gallery space at the same time. One screen shows men wearing white shirts and black pants in a stone fortress. The motivation behind their collective actions is never explained, but they seem to revolve around the cannons located on the building's rooftop. On the other screen, women wearing black shadors are shown making their way to a beach where they will later push a small group of women out to sea in a rowboat. Whether the women are being persecuted or liberated, whether they chose to leave or were forced to go is unclear. This scene in Rapture takes on added resonance in relation to the worldwide refugee crisis. Because she deals with social, political, and cultural issues in a very poetic way, Neshat's work has a broad appeal to audiences from diverse communities and backgrounds. In more recent years, it has become increasingly acceptable to address the ways in which people transcend the conventional boundaries of identity. For her project series in the 1990s and early 2000s, the Korean artist Nikki S. Lee joined a number of different U.S. communities, ranging from yuppies to lesbians in places from trailer parks to tourist destinations. She tried to fully integrate herself into these groups, um, shopping in the stores that they frequented, listening to their music, and adopting their mannerisms. After radically changing her physical presentation, and once she felt like she had become a genuine member of the group, she had a snapshot self-portrait taken with her new peers. Although she told the people in these close-knit groups that she was an artist, most of them did not believe her. For her seniors project of 1999, Lee used a makeup artist and thoroughly convinced these people that she was a legitimate elderly acquaintance. Um, most of her peers in this group considered her story about being an artist to be a sign of her senality. Um, for the Exotic Dancers Project in 2000, Lee went on a diet and then immersed herself in a radically different subculture of adult entertainment and exotic dancing. Um, the guises that she takes on in this project series can be seen as a sign of connection for Lee, who genuinely likes people and considers her identity to be very fluid. However, what seemed to be a post-ethnic rejection of essentializing identity in the 1990s has been revisited more recently, um, particularly after the racial reckoning of 2020 as being a more problematic example of cultural appropriation. Um, in a 2006 interview, the artist said, quote, Western culture is very much about the individual, while Eastern culture is more about identity in the context of society. You simply cannot think of yourself out of context. Catherine Opie also uses photography to investigate the nuances of gender and identity. Um, early series like Being and Having from 1991 or her portraits series from 1993 to 97 depict friends in lesbian and gay communities in LA um, and they sort of mix traditional portraiture with less traditional subjects. Um, and in her domestic series, she traveled across the United States to photograph lesbian couples in their everyday settings. Again, using a sort of traditional portrait photography with 
more non-traditional subjects. Um, so here we see Melissa and Lake from Durham, North Carolina in 1998. Um, the couple, they look somewhat fam um, similar to one another, but the focus is on their bond, their relationship, not their appearance. And really it's not even about their gender or their sexual identity, just the connection between two human beings. And so portraits like these introduce many viewers to new ways of life or cause viewers to consider familiar people or things in new or different ways. Lastly, we have Angelica Doss's Human A Project. This is an ongoing project um, that consists of the artist taking more than 3,000 portraits in an attempt to capture every shade of the human skin tone. Um, Doss says that she doesn't think she'll ever actually accomplish this. However, she's already come much farther than any other person in cataloging just how diverse the spectrum of human skin colors is. Um, she sort of describes this as a chromatic inventory. So she takes a portrait of the sitter with a blank background and then takes samples of their skin tone using Photoshop to create a background that matches their skin tone. Um, she spent over three years shooting portraits in over 19 cities around the globe. Um, she said that her goal was to create a discussion platform about identity and to be a way of subverting our normal codes and to really have us think or excuse me, rethink the diversity of humanity. Now these portraits are framed from the shoulder up and the sitter does not wear any clothing that might act as an indicator of class or culture. She generally leaves out all references to nationality, origin, economic status, age, etc. And she's quite careful when she um, arranges these compositions to avoid setting them up in a spectrum of light to dark. She's really trying to draw an awareness of how often cultures or societies rely on binaries, on things like black and white or male and female. And she's really trying to encourage her viewers to think more in terms of multiple.